I know what my father was, what he did. I know the Mad King earned his name. Burn them all! Kill every Targaryen I get my hands on. Everyone who isn't us is an enemy. Sir Illyn, bring me his head. What's up ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for another Game of Thrones update video. Today I want to further discuss the new series HBO is currently working on. HBO did announce that they ordered a new pilot for a prequel show to Game of Thrones, and this new series will take place during the Age of Heroes. There isn't a ton of information about this time period, but I want to go over some of that information that is in the books, then hopefully we can get a better sense of what type of show we can expect to see. When I first saw the headline that HBO wanted to make a series about the Age of Heroes, my first thought was, well that is kind of vague, because the Age of Heroes lasted for thousands of years. But if you look at the statement they released, it does narrow it down a little bit. Let's take a look at HBO's statement, then we can start discussing what I think this show will most likely cover. So far, all HBO has said about this new pilot is it will be taking place thousands of years before the events of Game of Thrones. The series chronicles the world's descent from the Golden Age of Heroes into its darkest hour. And only one thing is for sure. From the horrifying secrets of Westeros' history, to the true origin of the White Walkers. The mysteries of the East, to the Starks of legend. It's not the story we think we know. It definitely sounds like at least a portion of this show will take place during the Long Night. But what we think we know about the Long Night might not actually be true. Even the origins of the White Walkers might not be true, according to the version we got in Game of Thrones. But before I go down that road, let me go over some of the basic details about the Age of Heroes. Like I said earlier, the Age of Heroes lasted for thousands of years, in which kingdoms rose and fell, noble houses were founded and withered away, and great deeds were accomplished. Yet what we truly know of those ancient days is hardly more than what we know of the Dawn Age. The tales we have now are the work of septons and maesters writing thousands of years after the fact. Yet, unlike the Children of the Forest and the Giants, the first men of this Age of Heroes left behind some ruins and ancient castles that can corroborate parts of the legends. And there are stone monuments in the borrow fields and elsewhere marked with their runes. It is through these remnants that we can begin to ferret out the truth behind these tales. What is commonly accepted is that the Age of Heroes began with the Pact, and extended through the thousands of years in which the first men and the children lived in peace with one another. Now, for those of you who aren't very familiar with the timeline, I will go over some of the things that we have been told. Since the new series is going so far back in time, you're gonna need to know some of these things in order to give context to what we might see. Take a look at the timeline on the screen and look all the way to your left. 13,000 years ago, Westeros was inhabited by the Children of the Forest, and they weren't just living beyond the wall in a cave. At this time, they basically had free reign over the continent. That was until the first men arrived about 12,000 years ago, and this was known as the Dawn Age. The first men came from Essos, which is where the legend of Azor Ahai comes from. When the first men showed up in Westeros, all hell broke loose. They started to move in on the Children of the Forest, and the first men started cutting down everything in sight including the children's sacred weirwood trees. This is when the children of the forest really started to fight back. The children's weapons and armor were shit compared to what the first men had at the time. The children actually had armor made out of tree bark, while the first men had armor made out of bronze, so you can only imagine how brutal these battles must have been. It had gotten so bad that the children thought they were going to go extinct. But they are very resilient creatures, who knew their woods better than the men who came to cut them down. Not only did the children have home field advantage, but they also knew magic, which the first men knew nothing of. These conflicts lasted for another 2,000 years, until they made the pact on what is now known as the Isle of Faces. After 2,000 years of bloodshed, the two sides finally agreed to bring their fighting to an end. Both groups came together on an island in the middle of a great lake in central Westeros, known as the God's Eye. There they forged a lasting peace known as the Pact. The open lands were granted to humanity, while the deep forests were to remain the undisturbed domain of the children. The first men were forbidden from ever cutting down a sacred weirwood tree again. And to commemorate the Pact, the children of the forest carved a face 
into every weirwood tree on the island, making each a heart tree, and thereafter the island has been known as the Isle of Faces. After they made their pact, this is when the Age of Heroes begins. Things were relatively peaceful at this time, but after another 2000 years pass, this is when all hell breaks loose again, during what is known as the Long Night. As the first men established their realms following the pact, little troubled them save their own feuds and wars, or so the histories tell us. It is also from these histories that we learn of the Long Night, when a season of winter came that lasted a generation. A generation in which children were born, grew into adulthood, and in many cases died without ever seeing the spring. Indeed, some of the old wives' tales say that they never even beheld the light of day. So complete was the winter that fell on the world. While this last may well be no more than fancy, the fact that some cataclysm took place many thousands of years ago seems certain. In this time, night seems to last for a generation, and the longest, coldest, and darkest winter descends on Westeros. The ice spreads down from the far north, and under the cover of darkness, the others invade Westeros from the uttermost north, marching, killing, and raising up the dead to be their servants, and nearly destroying all men in Westeros. However, the Long Night comes to an end with the Battle for the Dawn. The children and the first men unite to defeat the others with dragonglass weapons, and with the Night's Watch, pushing them back into the frozen reaches of the far north. Legendary figures from this time include the last hero and Azor Ahai, who forged a red sword of heroes known as Lightbringer. We have heard of the last hero from one of Old Nan's tales. During the long night, he set out into the Deadlands with a sword, a horse, a dog, and a dozen companions. For years he searched, until he despaired of ever finding the children of the forest in their secret cities. One by one his friends died, and his horse, and finally even his dog, and his sword froze so hard the blade snapped when he tried to use it. And the others smelled the hot blood in him, and came silent on his trail stalking him with packs of pale white spiders, big as hounds. And we have heard of Azor Ahai from Melisandre and even Salador San in the books. Azor Ahai is a legendary figure in the Faith of R'hllor, also known as the Lord of Light. Thousands of years ago, he forged the sword Lightbringer, which he used to defeat the darkness of the Great Other. Now, the problem with legends like these are, we don't even know if they are true. It could also be possible that the last hero and Azor Ahai are the same person. I am hoping some of these questions get answered with the new series HBO is doing because in their statement they did say only one thing is for sure. From the horrifying secrets of Westeros' history to the true origin of the White Walkers, the mysteries of the East to the Starks of legend, it's not the story we think we know. Everything we've been told could be a lie, including what happened directly after the Long Night ended. One thing I am hoping this new series will cover is how the White Walkers were actually stopped during the Long Night. This is one part of the story that is left open for interpretation, but I need to know the facts. Is the story about the last hero in Azor Ahai just another bedtime story? Or were these legendary figures real people? If they were, then I need to know exactly how they were able to get the White Walkers to go back to the lands of Always Winter. Were the others scared of one of these legendary characters, or did they make some kind of a peace treaty? All we've really been told is, the others were pushed back into the north, and this is when the wall was built and the Night's Watch was established. This is back when the Children of the Forest used to give the Night's Watch a hundred daggers of obsidian every year. These are a few of the other interesting things this new show may cover. HBO's statement does mention the true origin of the White Walkers, but we could also get the origin story of the Night's Watch. They are the sworn brotherhood that has defended the Wall for centuries and millennia, born in the aftermath of the Long Night. The history of the Night's Watch is a long one, and the same thing goes for the Wall itself. Legend has it that the giants helped raise the wall, using their great strength to wrestle the blocks of ice into place. There may be some truth to this, though the stories make the giants out to be far larger and more powerful than they truly were. These same legends also say that the children of the forest would contribute their magic to the construction of the wall, but all of these legends should be taken with a grain of salt. Whether the legends are true or not, 
It is plain that the first men and the children of the forest, along with the giants, must have feared something enough that it drove them to begin raising the wall. History tells us that this is how the wall was built, but can we trust it? We know the others can manipulate the ice with their own magic, so how do we know it wasn't the others who actually built the wall? Beneath the shadow of that wall of ice, the Night's Watch raised 19 strongholds. The greatest and oldest of these is the Night Fort which has been abandoned for the past 200 years. The Night Fort has many legends of its own, and the oldest of these tales concern the legendary Knight's King, the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. No one knows anything about the first 12 Lord Commanders that come before him, and the true story behind that could be an interesting story of its own. We don't know the names of the first 12 Lord Commanders of the Night's Watch, but I have always wondered if it has something to do with the last hero's 12 companions that either went missing or died. Depending on how many years this new show will cover, we may find out more about the original Knight's King that ruled the wall from the Knight Fort for 13 years with his corpse queen, who was also known as the Knight's Queen. I've always been fascinated by this story because it ends in a Cain and Abel fashion. According to Old Nan, she says the Knight's King was named Brandon Stark, and when he met this sorceress that was pale as a corpse, they started making sacrifices to the others, which means the babies that were given to the others beyond the wall had Stark's blood. So some of these White Walkers might actually be bastard Stark children. At the time, the Night's King's brother was the King in the North, the King of Winter, who also happened to be a Stark. When he found out what his brother was doing at the wall, this really pissed him off. This pissed him off so bad he was even willing to make an alliance with the king beyond the wall, who was known as Joramin. And together they ended the Night's King and Queen's reign over the wall. Knowing the Night's King was giving sacrifices to the others, this led the king in the north to obliterating his name from memory. All records of him were destroyed, but I am hoping this new series will be able to cover some of this time period. That way we can get some more answers and hopefully find out the truth behind the legend of the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. We are also going to learn more about the Starks of Legend, and I'm hoping we can find out more about how they are directly linked to the White Walkers. The Night's King was most likely a Stark, but I think there is more to it than just that. I think everything about the Starks is connected to the White Walkers, and if this is true, we may find out the horrifying secrets behind how this happened. I recently made a video about how Stark's ancestral Valyrian steel sword, Ice, and the name of their sword dates all the way back to the Age of Heroes, which is exactly what time period this show is going to cover. Their Valyrian steel sword was several hundred years old, but the name itself was thousands of years old. They have been naming their house sword, Ice, ever since the Age of Heroes, and I think this is another direct link to the White Walkers and the Long Night. Catelyn Stark actually thinks about this in one of her chapters as she is watching Ned clean the sword under the heart tree. We can also find out why the Starks chose their house words, Winter is Coming, and even find out why their castle was named Winterfell. I tend to believe it is all tied into the events that happened during the Long Night. The greatest castle of the North is Winterfell, the seat of the Starks since the Dawn Age. Legend says that Brandon the Builder raised Winterfell after the generation-long winter, known as the Long Night, to become the stronghold of his descendants, the Kings of Winter. In my opinion, one of the most fascinating things about Winterfell is what lies below the ground. The crypts of Winterfell are larger than Winterfell itself with the older Starks buried in deeper and darker levels. The lowest level is said to be partially collapsed, and I would love to find out what was put in there when Winterfell was originally constructed. Since all of this was made right after the Long Night ended, we could potentially see some of this happen in the new series. I know most of us have been dying to know more about the Crypts of Winterfell and the Kings of Winter who reside in them. Song and story tell us that the Starks of Winterfell have ruled large portions of land beyond the Neck for 8,000 years, styling themselves the Kings of Winter. It would be interesting to learn more about some of these Starks of Legend, because we could also see how they acquired some of their magical abilities, like being able to warg into animals. There were chronicles found in the archives of the Night's Watch at the Night Four, and they speak of the War of Sea Dragon Point. 
wherein the Starks brought down the War King and his inhuman allies, the Children of the Forest. After the War King was defeated by the Starks, they had his sons put to the sword, along with his beasts and green seers. But the War King's daughters were taken as prizes by their conquerors. So it sounds like the Starks laid with some of the War King's daughters, which is how some of the future members of House Stark had the ability to warg into animals. Also, the Starks feuding with the Boltons dates all the way back to the Age of Heroes as well. Jamie Lannister once said, During the Age of Heroes, the Boltons used to flay the Starks and wear their skins as cloaks. We know Ramsay Bolton had Winterfell torched, but that wasn't the first time a Bolton had done this. King Royce Bolton had also taken and burned Winterfell. The Starks and the Boltons have been killing each other for over 8,000 years. Of course, there are some other legendary figures from the Age of Heroes that they could introduce. That's if any of these legends have any truth to them. One of these characters is known as Sir Artis Aaron, who lived many thousands of years ago during the Age of Heroes, and he is remembered in song and story as the Winged Knight. He supposedly rode upon a huge falcon, the same way a Targaryen would ride upon a dragon. It is said that armies of eagles fought at his command, and to win the veil, he flew to the top of the giant's lance and slew the Griffin King. He counted giants amongst his friends and wed a woman of the Children of the Forest, though she died giving birth to his son. There are a hundred other tales told of him, but in the World of Ice and Fire book, it is said that it is highly unlikely that such a man ever existed like Land the Clever in the Western Lands, and Brandon the Builder in the North. The Winged Knight is made of legend, not of flesh and blood. Another one of these legendary figures is known as Garth Greenhand, and his story is very interesting in its own right. He was the High King of the First Men, and it was he who led them out of the East, and across the land bridge to Westeros. But other tales would have us believe that he preceded the arrival of the First Men by thousands of years making him not only the first man in Westeros, but the only man in Westeros, wandering the land alone, and treating with the giants and the children of the forest. Some even say he was a god. Now what's also interesting about Garth Greenhand is some of these legends say he is a contemporary of Brandon the Builder, Leon the Clever, and some of the other colorful figures of the Age of Heroes. But in other legends, it also says that he is the ancestor to them all. God or man, Garth Greenhand fathered many children in this new land. On this, all the tales agree. Many of Garth's offspring grew to be heroes, kings, and great lords in their own right, founding mighty houses that endured for thousands of years. Even the heroes of other lands and kingdoms are sometimes numbered amongst the offspring of the Greenhand. Brandon the Builder was descended from Garth by way of Brandon of the Bloody Blade. These tales would have us believe. Even Lan the Clever was said to be a bastard, born to one of Garth's daughters, Floris the Fox. But other tales would say that Lan the Clever would only pose as one of his descendants. That way he could get some of the inheritance. Which does make some sense because Lan the Clever was known for doing shit like this. Lan the Clever is another legendary figure from the Age of Heroes. The Lannisters are an old family, tracing their descent back to Lan the Clever. In the songs, Lan was the fellow who tricked the Casterlies out of Casterly Rock with no weapon but his wits, and stole gold from the sun to brighten his curly hair. The last tale has certain intriguing aspects that might hint at the truth of what actually occurred. It is Archmaester Periston's belief that Lan the Clever was a retainer of some sort, in service to Lord Casterly perhaps a household garb, who might have impregnated his lordship's daughter, or daughters, though that seems less likely, and persuaded her father to give him the girl's hand in marriage. If indeed this was what occurred, assuming, as we must, that Lord Casterly had no trueborn sons, then in the natural course of events the rock would have passed to the daughter, and hence to Lan, upon the father's death. There is no more historical evidence for this than any of the other versions. All that is known is for certain is that sometime during the Age of Heroes, the Casterlies vanish from the Chronicles, and the unknown Lannisters appear in their place. Lan the Clever supposedly lived to the age of 312, and sired a hundred bold sons and a hundred daughters, 
So as you can see, the Age of Heroes has a very rich history of its own, and I barely scratched the surface in this video, but I just wanted to go over some of the events and colorful figures from this time period because we might get to learn more about them and their true stories in the upcoming prequel to A Game of Thrones. I don't know about you, but I am very excited about this because there is a lot of potential here. Let me know what you think, and please feel free to correct me if I got any of the details wrong but I did my best to pull directly from the books, that way I could be as accurate as possible. Anyways, I want to thank you all for watching today's video, I really appreciate that, and I also want to thank everyone on Patreon for continuing to support the channel. I hope you all have a great day, I will see you again very soon. Bye.